So I'm getting it up and running right now. <clears throat> hey folks, um, I'm gonna give it a moment or two before we actually start this discussion. Apologies, I don't think this is the link that actually was for the advertisement, but we're having some technical difficulties today. So hopefully this gives you a few minutes to be able to shift over to the right screen to watch this on, but it is streaming for us. So just one second and then we'll get going with our talk today. Okay, let's get going so we have plenty of time. Um, thanks everyone for joining today. Uh, this is the seventh seminar of FISH 513, Cultivating Inclusive Conservation Practices. I would like to thank the University and the School of Aquatic and Fishery Sciences in addition to the Campus Sustainability Fund for making this seminar possible. If you are interested in following along with readings, they are posted on the class website that's posted in the video description or will be when I properly ed this, edit this video. And just a note to folks, the closed captions aren't in real time, but I will add those to the videos later. And also as a note, we will not be having seminar next week, but we'll resume the following week for our last seminar of the quarter. So I'd like to start off with a land acknowledgement and personal reflection. The University of Washington acknowledges the Coast Salish peoples of this land, the land which touches the shared waters of all tribes and bands within the Suquamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations. I would also like to acknowledge that we are in traditional lands of the Duwamish people who are the first people of Seattle. As I've mentioned, we don't have class next week and that is because of the Thanksgiving holiday. And because of this, my reflection this week is obviously focused on what that holiday means and how I want to respond to it. As this holiday completely revolves around a fiction that has been intentionally designed to make non-native and specifically white folks feel more comfortable and without responsibility for the past, this holiday is often basically a slap in the face to many native people. So we, non-native folks, but also specifically white folks, have the opportunity to confront the true history of what happened with respect to white colonialism and the resulting genocide, starvation, disenfranchisement, and erasure of native peoples in these lands on which we live. That can and should be done every day, but it is especially important to do on this day that has had such heavy handed marketing to intentionally conceal such terrible atrocities and rewrite history. So now I'm not gonna be giving any guidelines on how to spend your specific day looking at pieces written by native activists. Folks choose to do a variety of things all the way from traditionally celebrating their gratitude for their families, reaffirming their advocacy or fasting among other responses. But regardless of what you choose to do, please let it include recognizing the true history of the day. My ability to love my family and friends and be grateful for things in my life is not mutually exclusive from my ability to recognize that this aspect of our history should be confronted. And I can be grateful while also learning and reaffirming my commitment to not let history and the ongoing struggles of Native folks in light of white supremacy go unacknowledged and unspoken. So it is my hope that if we continue to confront the events and attitudes that led and often continue to lead to the mistreatment, murder, and abuse of so many Native people, that one day we could all include in our list of thanks the fact that we live in a world where we are aware, where we care, and where we are all working to overcome injustices and make us thankful for a more equitable and just country. So on that note, I would like to introduce our speaker today. Uh, Brett Shatuck is a restoration ecologist who has worked for over 12 years for the Tulalip tribes, primarily in the Snohomish and Stiligwamish river basins from the headwaters to near shore on various scales of restoration projects. His current work is focusing on protection and restoration of natural rivering and floodplain processes through land conservation and habitat connectivity. And with that, I will let him take it away. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Let me... Uh... Um, is there any opportunity to share my screen by chance? Yep, you should be permissed to do so now. All right, let me do that. There we go. Everybody seeing my screen here? Looks great. All right, thank you very much. Well, thank you great for that uh, for that introduction and for the opening remarks. Really appreciate it. 
Um, and yeah, thanks for that. I'm going to be talking today about some restorations um, ideas and stuff. So I'm glad you guys are all paying attention and it's going to be fun. If I can advance my slide, that'd be awesome. There we go. So first, I'm going to talk a little bit about Tulalip and 3D rights. I appreciate the introduction there, kind of got things started. And then I'm going to talk about some of the current challenges and ways we might address them when it comes to our restoration, especially of aquatic environments. And then I'm going to talk about three kind of case studies and projects we've done in the past with collaborative, collaborative restoration efforts in the Pilchuck River, in the Kalut Estuary, and then a floodplain acquisition strategy that we're currently developing and have utilized already a bit. So hopefully that'll all be interesting, and I, I'm glad you guys are here to, to take part in this. So the Tulalip tribes have been uh, around for over 12,000 years in this area, and they view themselves as part of the natural environment. They were here as there were huge ice shelves over the top of us. They were here as that ice melted, as the first rivers formed, as the first salmon went up the rivers. So they, I think, adequate, um, accurately view themselves as, as being part of this natural environment. They've been here for a really long time. And it's only really recently, in that little tiny blue section of time that um, European folk uh, made contact and started uh, impacting the environment in different ways uh, than had been done for the last 12,000 years. So the first contact for Tulalip tribes and other tribes around here uh, was Captain Vancouver who came in Tulalip Bay in, in 1792. And that was where he first met the Tulalip people. He remarked that they were quite helpful and friendly and that they caught some nice fish in the bay. So they existed back then. And then, um, the, you know, a lot of things started changing, obviously. A lot of people started moving to this region. Population growth uh, started becoming an issue and there were conflicts between native people and settlers. And so Governor Isaac Stevens was sent out here to the Pacific Northwest to start signing treaties with tribes um, so that that settlement could be uh, completed more easily. And one of the treaties that were signed, a lot of them were signed really in really close proximity time-wise. Uh, and in 1855, the Treaty of Point Elliot was signed with the Tulalip people and a variety of other tribes, um, which kind of, set the stage for future events um, to come in terms of, of how the United States and tribes interacted with one another. And as part of the uh, treaty, essentially there was a large area of land that was ceded to the United States. Um, there were certain reservations that were retained by the Tulalip people and other tribes. Um, and there are other things that were retained as well, including the right of taking fish in common with all citizens. Um, and that also extended to other natural resources like uh, game and plant species and just general uh, kind of, they're called treaty protected resources, a lot of natural resources. Um, but as you might expect, um, the treaty wasn't necessarily completely uh, adhered to by the state or by the, the, by the nation. Um, and there were a lot of conflicts that started happening. And these were kind of referred to as the fish wars, which started to kind of come to a head in the 60s and 70s where a lot of native people uh, were trying to exercise their treaty rights and were being blocked from doing so by the state of Washington and other private people. And so it became quite a big deal. Marlon Brando became part of the effort. You can see Mayor in the upper photo. Uh, some of the big names that were around as uh, back then and were continued up till recently, Billy Frank Jr. Uh, were part of the effort too. And finally, the U US government ended up suing the, the state of Washington or bringing them to court stating that they had to start uh, accepting treaty rights. And so Judge uh, Bolt here on the left uh, made a decision which kind of had wide ranging consequences for the tribes moving forward. Um, basically what he said was that in common with meant 50% and that was what was determined to have been meant back in the day. So tribes are now allowed to get 50% of their harvest of, of fish and other species within their what's called usual and accustomed areas. Um, also, subsequent um, decisions made it to where tribes also have co-management authorities. So tribes have the ability to help manage those natural resources and make sure, make sure that they're perpetuated with the state and the federal government and um, other people who are living in this area. And also uh, the big uh, other other decisions which are currently in, in process and, and have been continuing to go for a long time, including the Culvert case, which you may know about, is that the, these resources, not only do the tribes have a right to them, 
but they have the right to make sure that they continue to exist. So you, you know, if you have 50% of nothing, it's still nothing. So basically the tribes are need to be able to make sure that other people, including the state and the federal government, do not um, destroy those treaty protected resources. So the tribes are able to continue to harvest them, continue their culture and spiritual practices and their economic activities. So the Tulalip tribes specifically are actually a group of tribes. That's why it's called the Tulalip tribes, plural. It's uh, bands from the Snohomish, Snoqualmie, Skagit, Seattle, Samish, and Stiligwamish among others. Um, so all those uh, tribal bands came to actually the place of Tulalip, which refers to the Tulalip Bay, which is where the reservation is currently located. And there's a lot of very active uh, culture that continues to happen and along with economic activities, including fishing and a lot of other cultural practices. And it, it's still a very large piece of the Tulalip people and who they view themselves as. So this map shows, uh, it's kind of a draft map of the um, adjudicated usual and custom fishing area for Tulalip. So you can see that it includes a good chunk of Snohomish County, King County, Skagit County, Island County, San Juan County, and a good chunk of the Salish Sea. So there's a lot of co-management that happens within this area and even in larger areas, especially when it comes to uh, managing wildlife species and plant species and things like that. But I'm gonna focus primarily on the, on the usual and custom fishing area. And I'm specifically going to focus a little bit more on this, the Wamish and Snomish rivers, um, as was kind of discussed in the opening. So I'm going to, and I'm going to talk in primarily about restoration of salmon because there's such a big importance to the Tulalip people and other Salish tribes in this region. And, and what we focus on for a lot of reasons, including the fact that a lot of them are in pretty bad shape and uh, we want to make sure that they're continued to exist. So some of the problems that we're seeing that are causing these big declines are, are habitat loss. We have about only about 85% of, sorry, 85% has been lost from estuary habitats and probably as much or more in floodplain habitats and upstream habitats. So we have about 15% that we're working with right now. We're seeing huge population growth, Snohomish County and these other Northern counties just uh, adjacent to King County are definitely growing. And a lot of that growth is happening outside of cities. So we're seeing impacts in our watersheds um, and those are continuing to grow at faster rates and causing increased degradation. And we're not keeping up with restoration uh, with degradation that we're seeing. So that's kind of unfortunate. Obviously where there's climate change impacts, which have huge, uh, huge consequences for all of our fish species that are of great importance to the tribes and within our area. And we're seeing subsequent huge declines in population. There were lots of threatened species, uh, Chinook and other species were at the lowest population levels ever, ever last year, despite all of our restoration efforts. So we need to start shifting. And how do we do that? So this is Billy Frank Jr. He was really important in part of the fish wars and he just passed away not too long ago, but he's been a huge uh, person who's been involved with tri tribal treaty rights from the beginning. And one of his most famous quotes is, as the salmon disappear, so do our cultures and our treaty rights. We're at a crossroads and we're running out of time. And uh, that's definitely true today. And so how do we move that forward? That's kind of the question. That's what I deal with on kind of a daily basis. How do we, prior how do we prioritize actions when we see all these uncertainties coming down the road? We have, you know, there's so much uncertainty with climate change and population growth and regulation and, and all these things in the future. How do we deal with that with all this uncertainty? How can we even make progress? So what we've kind of chosen is to look at connectivity, connectivity of habitats, uh, making sure that those floodplains are reconnected, those estuary habitats are reconnected and that those uh, connected areas are all connected to each other. So just creating connectivities, both longitudinally and uh, laterally across these habitat types. We want to focus on natural processes. We want to get to down the road on engineered designs, but we want to look primarily at these natural processes and how we can get them to go for a whole variety of reasons. And by doing this, we hope to increase resiliency in the face of all these challenges and these uncertainties moving forward. And so there's been a lot of look, work looking at what kind of restoration projects we can do in the aquatic environment to help get this re resiliency and, and uh, to help fight back some of these changes we see with population growth and, and um, climate change. And so we've really focused on these top two, the longitudinal connectivity, connectivity up and down rivers and stream systems, and also floodplain connectivity. So uh, across, across sections, across that floodplain, making sure that those areas are also connected because so much of it's been disconnected. 
And we're also kind of changing our, our thoughts on scale. You know, some of our folks here in our watershed say, if you can't see it from space, it's probably not big enough. And that's kind of showing to be true. And a lot of the restoration projects we're focusing on now, if you kind of zoom out to about 62 miles on Google Earth and you look down and you can see the footprint of the project you're working on, that's probably about the scale we need to be looking at if we want to get these, these, uh, these populations from becoming extinct in the, in the near future. And so that's kind of the scale we're trying to look at when our, with our larger projects. And to do these scales of projects and do these types of projects, it's required that we have collaboration with, with everybody involved. We need to get these communication, we need to get collaboration agreement on at least portions of what we need to do. And that includes all levels of collaboration with government, other tribes, NGOs, businesses, stakeholders, and the public. We really need to get everybody involved so that we can get the funding we need, so we can get the political will we need to get these things moving, and so that we can get the actual access on the ground to get stuff going. And those are and permitting and all these kinds of things. We need we need help. We need to get it done fast, and we need to get it done big uh, to help protect these tri tribal treaty resources and to maintain these cultures and these lifeways that are so important to the tribes and honestly to all citizens of Washington State. That's a, there's a reason people move here, and primarily it's because of these natural resources and these aesthetic places that are so important to everybody who lives here. So first I'm gonna focus on some projects that we looked at for longitudinal connectivity, looking at connectivity up and downstream on river and stream systems so that we can connect these systems and gain that resiliency. Um, and some examples of that, uh, uh, that's longitudinal connectivity are dam removals, right? So we can take certain habitats that have been cut off, certain life history types that are focused primarily on more river, uh, longer duration stays in river, in the river and snowmelt type of regimes and increase those diversity of, of, of life history types so that we can get that resiliency that we need, that, that diversity we need to stave off some of these uh, changes and challenges we're having coming down the road. And so one of the projects we just recently finished or kind of in the process of, of it's still kind of finishing is a dam removal project in the Pilchuck River um, called the Pilchuck Dam Diversion Dam Removal Restoration Project. And the Pilchuck River is, is, is a tributary to the Snohomish. It's really, really important for the tribal people uh, of Tulalip and a lot of our tribal members have family ties to that river. This is Pilchuck Julia. She was a big uh, kind of a, a person who lived in, in the Pilchuck River and is well known in, at the, in the Tulalip community and the larger community. Um, and she's gotten some recognition recently, but it's a really important uh, place both culturally and also for diversity for different types of uh, genetic uh, different diversity of genetic stocks that live in the Pilchuck River. And the Pilchuck River dam was had a substandard fish ladder. It impeded access to over 37 miles of habitat, which equated to about a third of the main stem river length. And it impeded a lots of lots of essentially all the species that we see in the river systems around here, including Chinook, Coho, Steelhead, um, Chum, Pink, uh, bull trout and a whole variety of other species. So here's a map of the Pilchuck River. It's, uh, you can see it enters into the Snohomish River and out into Port Gardner, into the Puget Sound there. And the red line di dictates where the dam was in relation to the, the river length. And the dam was installed initially in 1912 and then a larger one was installed in 1932 to supply domestic drinking water to the city of Snohomish through a 14 mile um, transmission main. And so that was where a lot of the city got most of its water for a while. And then it became supplemented by city of Everett Snowish PUD water that comes from Spada Lake upriver. Um, but essentially the city, um, the city decided it didn't need to use that water supply anymore because it was having so much trouble getting that water down. There was aging infrastructure and things like that. So here's a, here's a quick video that kind of shows a little bit of information about the dam. The dam was located right at this transition between the rural, residential, and the agricultural interface and the upstream forest of landscape. And the dam was about, 10, was about 10 feet tall and 60 feet wide. And like I said, it was a diversion dam. So it didn't have a lot of, of reservoir. It was just used to divert water to a water treatment plant and then to the city of Snohomish for drinking water. There wasn't a huge reservoir, as you can see, it just diverted that water. And there was a, a water intake facility, which is pictured here where the water was funneled before going down to the city. And then there was a fish ladder 
it was just substandard. Essentially, it was located on the inside of a meander bend. It would constantly fill in with sediment, and it wasn't adequately sized or located for attracting, especially species like Chinook salmon, who need, uh, who aren't the greatest swimmers and come up at when there's really low flows. It was in pretty deteriorated state. There was lots of uh, degradation of the dam itself. And when the fish would try to jump, they'd get skewered by these pieces of rebar and, and whatnot. So it, it basically was in a state of disrepair. There weren't attractive flows to get fish over the top. And so that's when we started seeing um, fish trying to jump over the dam itself in the spillway. These are coho salmon and they didn't have much success. They weren't being attracted into the fish ladder. And a lot of them were just getting mortality through blunt trauma by hitting the dam and, and falling off and not making it to their upstream spawning and rearing habitat, which is the best habitat in the whole Pilchuck River. It's the coolest. The Pilchuck River has big temperature challenges. And so getting those fish upstream into the best habitat that's the most protected was the goal of this project for all the species that we talked about. And here's what that upstream habitat looks like. The Pilchuck Dam is located in the star on the left side of the screen here. And the upstream habitat is just the best habitat for, especially for a lowland river in the Puget Sound. It's really great. There's a lot of great riparian habitat adjacent to the river, large trees, lots of shade, lots of cool temperatures, all kinds of habitat for rearing and spawning. Um, so it's really, really good prime habitat. Um, and here's what that fish ladder looks like a lot of the time after big flow events, uh, when it gets full of sediment. You can imagine that a large Chinook salmon or pretty much any fish would have challenges jumping over those uh, pools that are full of, of sediment. Uh, they're only a few inches deep. And so a big Chinook salmon is gonna have a tough time with that. So we were able to first collaborate with the city of Snohomish who owned the dam facility. And like I said, they were ready to get out of the water supply business. They actually invited us in for a meeting and said, we're ready to get out of this. We're ready to remove this dam. Would the Tulalip tribes be interested in collaborating with us to help uh, facilitate the dam removal if we're committed to, to removing that dam? And it took us a while to make sure that we're all on the same page, but eventually we signed an interlocal agreement with the city of Snohomish that allowed us to move forward and feel confident that we could get complete dam removal out of this situation without having to install additional infrastructure, which really saved us a lot of time and money. Downstream of the dam, like I said, it was right at that interface in the rural landscape. There was, there was a rural community and they were pretty close to the river in a lot of states. So we had to make sure that what we were going to do in the Pilchuck River wasn't going to impact them negatively or infrastructure downstream uh, to comply with, with a whole lot of things. We didn't want to cause that challenge. So we had to do a whole lot of, uh, of stuff first to do that. And the first thing we wanted to do was some outreach. So we did a lot of outreach with, uh, with the community and with stakeholders, with electeds, with uh, funders to be able to get this project off the ground. Outreach is always a huge deal. We hired a consulting firm to help with that effort. Um, we did all kinds of, of work to do that with brochures, postcards, and everything to get people engaged. And then eventually we held an open house uh, to get people on board with the project to make sure that the people, especially just adjacent to the, pro to the project, could hopefully be brought on board and, and be supportive of the project, but at least wouldn't cause problems with the project down the road in terms of filing uh, uh, appeals or lawsuits or things like that. And we had really great turnout because of all of our efforts we had. A large portion of the community came out to our open house and it was a great format where we were able to just put posters out, not have anybody take the floor, but just individual people could come in at their own leisure, ask various expert, experts about what the dam removal project was gonna look like and get their answers uh, dealt with individually so that um, it didn't become kind of a mob mentality and everybody got to kind of have their own say individually, which I think worked out really, really well. And then um, unfortunately, you know, COVID happened. So we weren't able to have these subsequent um, meetings, which we were really hoping to do these in-person meetings. So we kind of switched tasks towards more of a uh, virtual, uh, virtual way of getting people involved. And so one of the things we did was provide press kits to the media to try to get the word out that way. And we got all kinds of good press in, in the newspapers and radio stations and some local TV stations. So that was good to be able to get the word out that way. And then also we made all kinds of updates uh, we, and put them on our website. Uh, and after we compiled all, the, all of our um, email lists, we were able to really get a lot of people involved with, we had a great in-house media and marketing crew who could produce amazing videos. And we were able to use those to, to get the word out and a whole bunch of story maps to show, bring people along the process, make so solicit questions and just try to get all those problems out of the way before things got big. And the nice things we were able to get pretty far reaching um, 
uh, engagement. We got around 152,000 views on some of our Facebook videos. And so it was, it was a great way to get people engaged and excited about the project. So now I'm just gonna jump into what the project actually looked like. Here's what the dam looked like right before we started work and it was pretty high flows. And luckily they calmed down a bit before we started work. Then we started diverting the water over to the left bank to isolate our work area. We installed a temporary road and isolated fish and removed fish from our work area. We started demolishing the dam and dewatering the site, kept demolishing, pretty much got that whole uh, right bank side of the dam removed and then removed some armoring that was associated with the transmission main. Then we got the water put back in our previous work zone and started demolishing the fish ladder and the remaining portions of the dam on the left bank. Started that work, got that work done and started uh, grading a lot of the site, removed our temporary road. And this is essentially what the site looked like during low flows right after we were done with in-water work. And subsequently we got some big flows, which we were happy to be out of the river for, but started reshaping the landscape, which we knew was gonna happen. And we were excited to start seeing that, that process take shape. And this is more or less what the river looks like today. No dam left, nice fish passage, really great situation. I'm just gonna go quickly through some pictures of what that looked like. Here's us modifying the fish ladder to allow uh, water diversion. Here's that water diversion happening. Here's what it looked like downstream when we diverted the water. Here's us uh, starting to install our temporary road once we got the fish removed. We pumped all of our water to a, that we were working in that was full of concrete and turbidity to a downstream water treatment plant where we could infiltrate it into a infiltration pond, which worked out really nicely. And we ended up seeing pretty high pHs in our, in our water that we were treating and infiltrating, but no increases in pH in the downstream uh, in the river. So that was great to be able to treat it that way. And then we started just, uh, demolishing the dam with some hose with some hammers on them. It was pretty fun to see that start to happen. And we just used basically a, a, a couple of hose and a, and a track truck to get the, the concrete out of there. And here's what it looked like right after we were done and more or less what it looks like now, just looking downstream on the site. We're already seeing a lot of great use by fish, including Chinook and coho salmon. Um, and we're excited to see how that continues over the, over the years, but it's great to see these fish coming back just immediately right after dam removal. And so it's been a really fun process to see that. And we had a whole lot of partners to get this done from funding to permitting, to technical support, to outreach support. Uh, it takes an army to get a project like this done and a lot of effort and time. And we initially got about $2.2 million in funding and we were able to actually complete the project but with about half that money, about 1.2, which is a really great deal for 37 miles of habitat. And we we're able to work with our funders to uh, reallocate the remaining funding to other priority restoration projects in the, in the basin. So it's great to see that, that money going, to, going a little further. Our lessons learned is that I think early and often outreach is really important and it's really important to tell this captivating story to get people involved and to be uh, to be happy about your project. It's really important to be persistent. And I think that being pers persistent was really important and we don't we don't need to be too risk adverse and that I think we can kind of work with permitters to say, hey, you know, sometimes it doesn't make sense to spend money in some ways uh, to try to prevent it for, for being too safe. We want to be safe, but we don't want to we don't want to prevent natural processes in the way of being safe. In a lot of cases, we can actually do this work being safe and saving a lot of money and getting better results as a result of it. If you want to learn more about this, I really suggest going to PillCheckRiver.com. We have a great amount of videos there, which can really provide additional insights into the project. So now I'm going to transition into that uh, floodplain connectivity portion of the lateral connectivity uh, portion of our projects that we do. Um, and that really means taking these kind of simplified more or less ditch streams that have levees on them and, and rivers that have levees on them that are disconnected from their floodplain and grading that diversity back and that uh, kind of habitat that we really need. Because what we're seeing here is that a lot of the bottlenecks for restoration and for these populations of fish comes in this early rearing habitat stage, uh, which is really important uh, and that is provided in floodplain habitats and in estuary habitats. So we're really lacking, especially in those estuary habitats. So really important for species such as Chinook, um, which really utilize those habitats heavily. So one of the projects that we focused on was with the Kalut Estuary Restoration Project, which was more or less completed in 2015. And like I stated before, there was a lot of loss in our habitats in, in the estuary, about 15, only 15% 15 remains. 
So we focused on this 354 acre area. It's actually, this total site is more like 400 acres, but 354 acres of restored tidal processes in the Quilute estuary, um, kind of near the town of Marysville. And Quilute is the Lesheet seed word for marsh, which is a Salish language. And it was really important historically for fishing, hunting, and plant gathering. And it's obviously very important habitat, like I just stated for Chinook habitat and other species. It was utilized uh, and cut off um, with dikes and levee systems for uh, farming. I think it was primarily dairy farming. But by 2003, it essentially was just a big fallow field with 100% reed canary grass, which is an invasive species and aggressive species. It really wasn't providing benefits to anybody or any, any species or, or any livestock or economic uh, viability, viability or anything like that. And the glute restoration site was somewhat is somewhat adjacent to this big flats. Uh, you can see this kind of brown area next to the word that says big flats and EB slough. And that was an old trash dump uh, that was installed on the Toledo Reservation. And uh, I think it was a Seattle company that was dumped a uh, bunch of industrial and, and home waste from about 1964 to 79, 3.4 million tons of it with the loss of about 147 acres. And so there was a super fun site installed there and a natural resources damage assessment uh, trustees were set up to try to mitigate for that loss of habitat and the impacts that were done there. And that included the US Fish and Wildlife Service, Toledo Tribes, Department of Ecology and NOAA. And these were people who kind of helped start looking at um, the Quilute site and figuring out what to do in terms of mitigating those and also doing some subsequent restoration above and beyond that amount. And the first thing that was done by the trustees was to prioritize acquisition. So 55 acres, sorry, 55 parcels were purchased uh, with 32 different landowners with the idea to purchase as much as possible so that we could get the maximum amount of restoration work completed there as possible and natural processes completed. And the main implementation partners were the Tulela tribes and the, the Army Corps of Engineers. The Army Corps was really important to get funding and implementation for both the, the construction of a setback levee to help protect infrastructure and also to help remove uh, the remaining portions of the levee to get uh, tidal inundation brought back. And there were a whole lot of internal uh, pro project elements that were completed by the Tulalip tribes, including channel digging. We did build wave, uh, wave uh, attenuation berms. We had to bring in a whole bunch of sediment for the levee. We had to put a, a water quality um, kind of treatment cells and water treatment um, facility there, along with dealing with a whole bunch of infrastructure that was along the site. In 2015, we were able to get um, most of the internal work done and finally get the breach completed at the mouth of the Kulu estuary to allow uh, tidal inundation for the first time in, in over a hundred years. And it's kind of cool to see, like, it looks like a lung. You can see the, the, the tidal inundation coming in and coming out, like it's getting its breath back, really kind of fun to see. And here's kind of a little view of what that looks like. Uh, it looked like shortly after it was implemented in 2015. You can see a lot of these channels that we dug to connect the stream systems. We had to build almost a mile of levee with the core to protect an industrial park and some infrastructure along with a water treatment facility. We had to build all these wave attenuation berms. And as you can see, this was kind of done in, a, in, a, in an urban environment. There were quite a lot of uh, houses on the edge of this. So we had to deal with a lot of landowners, all their impacts, all of their uh, concerns, dealing with easements with each one of them. It was quite the process to get that get that project going, and it was done in, in concert with the city of Marysville, uh, with some mitigation that they was required on their part as well. And so, in 2016, after after the project was breached, this is more or less what it looked like, and now this is more or less what it looks like now, with some native vegetation starting to come back and uh, a lot more connectivity to our to our uh, estuary environment, which is great. The project took about 20 years from the beginning of soaping to the end. And you can see a lot of that time was spent acquiring property, doing easements and getting designs done. But a big chunk of it was the property acquisition time to do that. And it cost about $20 million from beginning to end. A large portion of that was building that setback levy to, to protect infrastructure and property acquisition were the two biggest costs. Uh, most of the project actual construction was relatively straightforward when it comes to actual restoration work. That big money was spent protecting people and land, which is pretty common for these types of projects. So the less kind of protection we have to do, the better, because it ends up costing a lot of money to build setback levies. And there were a whole lot of funders required to get that $20 million, including all these folks here. Um, so a big effort with grant management and getting those grants 
before the project was completed, there was very little diversity, primarily non-native species. And afterwards, we've been seeing a lot of, of Chinook and other species, uh, native species, enjoying the new habitat out there, which is great, along with a whole bunch of bird uh, increases in bird species, which is, which is great to see out there as well. And this one had even more people involved in it, as you can imagine, over 20 years and $20 million. That requires a lot of partnerships. And so we had to get a lot of people on board with this, pro with this project to get it actually completed in a way that was going to be good for everybody. So it was great to, to see this level of partnership. Um, and there were a lot of lessons learned over those 20 years, as you might expect, one of which was that acquisitions are hard. They're all individual. They take a long time. So getting those acquisitions started early is really important. Uh, one of the main things we learned is that we need bigger grant amounts of money. We can't really manage all these grants and expect it to be a, a good use of time and energy. We need bigger sources of funding I mean, for these types of big scale projects that we've been talking about. And outreach is really key, um, especially being responsive to landowners, getting things done, nip them in the, the bud before they become issues is really important. And interlocal agreements are really key. I think it could have been really helpful having a better, having an interlocal agreement with the city of Marysville, local jurisdictions uh, makes things go a lot more smoothly. So those interlocal agreements are really important to set uh, precedent for what, what moves forward. Also, it's really good because there are so many elements with the, with the Army Corps of Engineers and the Tulalip. We both had different, there were different design firms. There were different things like that. So having a principal designer, it would have been really nice that would oversee the whole project. And that coordination is really, really important between construction management and between project sponsors if there's multiple of them. We also found that it tends to, you know, working with the Corps is great. They bring a lot of funding and a lot of other benefits, but it also causes challenges in that it takes a really long time and they cost a lot of money to, to get to the design centers that they want. Um, and also there's a lot of staff turnover. So we just have to make sure that we're constantly bringing those people along as we go to make sure that um, we can always make sure everybody knows what the other arm or leg is doing. And then really important to let, uh, to make sure that all contractors know what the site conditions are so that uh, when construction is done, that they know how to, uh, that when they're doing construction, that they know what they're getting into and can bid accordingly. And again, there's a we have a website for this too, quilute.org. It's a great resource for a whole lot of other uh, resources associated with this project if you want to know more about it. Um, but another really great project uh, of regional importance in, in the area. So as I talked about earlier, I'm just going to move now into um, this floodplain acquisition strategy that we're working on. As I just discussed for the for the Quilute project. Um, a lot of the time associated with that and, the, and the, was associated with acquiring property. You know, it's, it's really difficult, takes a long time. And also a lot of the cost associated with that project was trying to protect people uh, or infrastructure that was in the floodplain. So we wanted to come up with a strategy that would help us get that, that acquisition piece done earlier when, and be able to acquire properties opportunistically as they came available and also try to prevent people from from building in the floodplain so that we don't have to see those costs later and we pre prevent that degradation from occurring in the first place. So we started building this, this tool. And so this is the Skykomish River. You can see it's largely cut off from its floodplain. A lot of floodplains used for agricultural, rural, residential, or even urban use. Here's the Snoqualmie, similar story. You can see that, that it's really simplified. It's essentially kind of a simplified channel with not much connectivity to the floodplain and, and not much intact riparian habitat. This is the Stiligwamish River. You can see all these side channels, these relic channels from like a LIDAR view, an elevation view. Looks pretty good, but when you go back to, a, to an aerial photo, you can see most of that habitat really isn't connected. So how do we get these habitats to look more like the Sock River? See, I mean, look at that kind of diversity. That looks awesome. Or the Queets. I mean, spectacular. Let's go that direction. Um, but unfortunately, providing these floodplain connectivity and complexity creates a, takes a long time and a large amount of area. And so we need to start somewhere. We need to start early. We need to take the long game on this. You know, we need to think about this in, in not in like in the next five, 10 years, but in the next 100 years, essentially. And we need to start that process now. So our strategy for that, for this uncertainty, is more or less purchase, protect, and restore. We want to purchase these landscapes. We want to stop any degradation from happening there and we want to restore habitat connectivity within them as much as possible. Because we know if floodplain restoration is most effective when we can do process based restoration, including that to allow channel migration, floodplain forest development, things like that. And we know this connectivity is really vital, including 
armoring removal and, and uh, dike removal and things like that. But a lot of landowners don't really want that to happen on their land if they own it, because that could mean they lose their land, portions of their, their acreage that they potentially would use for other uses. So acquisition is kind of important. And the purpose of the strategy is to provide a framework to prioritize parcels for acquisition, for restoration and conservation purposes, and to get that funding on the front end. Because what happens a lot of times is people say, oh, we'd like to sell our land. We kind of want to get out of here. Uh, can you buy it? And we'll say, yeah, in like three or five years, somewhere in there. And they're like, well, yeah, we're going to sell it to a developer instead. So we need to have that money on the front end because that's really important to be able to capitalize on this opportunistic availability. And the goal is really to provide this corridor of functioning habitat and to secure those treaty protected resources throughout the basin through that process. And so we can accelerate the project implementation. It's lagging behind. Like I said, we're, we're, we're losing habitat faster than we can gain it now. So we need to find ways to get it to go faster. We need this flood storage and conveyance, especially when we start seeing the impacts of climate change, which we know are gonna increase those problems. And of course, there's other, other benefits of this as well, including human safety and decreased flood damage claims. So we started on our first phase of work in the Skykomish, uh, Main Stem, Snohomish, and Pilchuck rivers. And what we did was break up that area into what we call floodplain units, areas of the floodplain that if we allow uh, natural processes to function, that they would essentially be affected as a unit. So you can see this is a floodplain unit, uh, kind of all these areas outlined in black are different floodplain units that we developed throughout the basin so that we could say, we're going to try to purchase a whole one of these floodplain units and then remove any infrastructure and allow natural processes to function. That's the long-term goal. We ended up with 205 of those floodplain units that range from about five to 2,000 acres with a total acreage of about 18,000 or well, 19,000 uh, acres around 30 square miles. And we took all of those floodplain units and within them, we kind of broke them into different metrics with scoring criteria that were broken up into kind of the importance of that floodplain unit for natural process function and for the survival of fish species, the feasibility of acquiring one of those floodplain units, and then the degradation of that floodplain unit. Was it in good shape? Was it in bad shape? And that's kind of how we used these metrics to kind of figure out how to move forward. And we came up with three basic scores for each floodplain unit. A base score, which was just the importance of that floodplain unit for natural process function, and the feasibility of acquiring it. So only those two suite of metrics. Then we looked at restoration. So here we looked at the importance, the feasibility, and the degradation. So the more degraded it was, the higher restoration it score in concert with how feasible it was to purchase it and how important it was to floodplain function. And then finally, the conservation score, which is kind of the reverse of the restoration score saying, is it important? Is it feasible? Is it in pretty good condition? It gets a and gets a con good conservation score. So you can use this tool to look at um, acquisition for either restoration or conservation purposes. And then finally, we look, we wanted to incorporate how close is it to other protected lands. So we looked uh, at is it is this land next to the river? Is it and is it protected? Uh, is it already under easement? Is it already um, purchased uh, and under control by uh, certain landowners that we know are going to have long-term natural process function interests at heart. So we looked at all those things and we were able to uh, produce this GIS decision support tool to help support that. And right now we're working on the next phase, which is looking at the Snoqualmie River to do that. And the third phase will be the estuary. And the hope is that we can provide a, a acquisition strategy where we can help kind of look at what's our strategy as a basin um, not just the Tulalip tribes, but the whole suite of organizations that work in this watershed to help prioritize how we want to acquire properties and essentially how we want to start restoration work from now for the next hundred years or so um, moving forward. And so that's kind of what we're working on now. And I'm really excited about that. We have a story map up. Um, I can provide the link. Uh, I think there, that might be in the reading section that was provided. And I really recommend going there if you want to learn more about what the metrics were, how we derived those metrics, um, and how we prioritize these landscapes. Um, and so now we're working, working to extend that to get that done. And we've already actually utilized the strategy. We want to do strategies that are only actionable. So the great thing is we've already gotten grant applications accepted to get multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars to implement this strategy to start acquiring properties already, um, even though we don't have completed the whole process yet. So it's a great actionable process that we can get these, 
these big floodplain processes back um, restored because that's really what's going to get us to the recovery we need. And again, this, these projects require all kinds of buy-in and uh, from funders, from the people who, who prioritize um, funding, who prioritize how we get these strategies done, um, and from all variety of groups, including farming groups, you know, NGOs that are, are for uh, environmental protection, conservation districts, other tribes. Um, it, it requires an army to get these things done. You can't do it in a vacuum. And um, to protect treaty protected resources, we really have to have all these people on board and to work together because it's just too big to do on our own. Um, the lessons learned from this is that these strategies are really key for funding. You know, if you want to have this opportunistic availability to capitalize on properties that are available, you have to have the funding more or less in hand. And so we really need these strategies and we need to have these, we really need to do, we kind of know what the problem is in these systems. Now it's time to create strategies that will really be actionable to where you can get this work done. Um, An acquisition is in flexibility associated with it is key in terms of timelines and the funding available for it. We really need this large geographic extent because we can apply for, for funding now at a huge geographic scale as opposed to just a parcel scale. And if that parcel falls through, we're just out of luck. Instead, now with this big geographic scale, we can say we're going to buy property in this huge area and we're going to figure out using this prioritization tool so we can get a grant to just look and figure out what's the most important and figure out what's the most important at that specific time. Of course, communication and collaboration is hugely important for this. And we really need to play the long game when it comes to these, these acquisitions. We need to act now, but we need to think about it over the long term for protecting these tribal protected resources. And so that's more or less all I have to say. Um, Billy Frank was pretty optimistic. He was the guy who said, you know, get ready. For, these fish are coming back. And um, I feel like what we need to do now is just set up these habitats. We've got we to set them up so when we get good ocean conditions, when we start dealing with the other issues in our watershed, including uh, toxic issues and, and other issues that are, that are causing challenges for fish, that we just set them up for when they do have good conditions, they can really come back. Salmon are resilient. They're amazing creatures. And I think we can, we can do this if we work together. And obviously, tri tribal treaty protected resources are hugely important to tribes. They're important to everyone else as well. So with that, I'll, I'll close. And I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions uh, anyone might have. Thank you very much, Brett. That was very great. Um, unfortunately, you can't hear the applause that are happening in the world, but they're happening. So thank you. Um, I really appreciated your talk because I feel like it's it's really sort of meshing not only ecosystem function, but cultural use, tribal sovereignty, food sovereignty, rural communities, communication, all of these things sort of tied together to try and accomplish this work. I guess I'm curious, um, what kind of communication, and by the way, if anybody has questions, you should be asking them on YouTube while I ask this question, but uh, what kind of communication was done with the, the members of the tribal community as well when you were doing this sort of work to try and, you know, get feedback and see where people were feeling on the various projects and engage on the projects? Certainly. Obviously, you know, um, our... Um, we work, we don't work in a vacuum and, and I don't work in a vacuum for sure. So I've got all kinds of people that I collaborate, you know, externally and internally. First, you know, the first line of defense is always, I mean, the first process of, of, of everything is always checking with our membership and with our leadership to make sure that our priorities align with, uh, all of our priorities are aligned in, in, in what we want. Um, and, you know, there's a, a whole variety of, of ways we can do that. You know, we do provide information. All this information is, you know, we bring them to meetings, board meetings, which um, are also uh, provided to the membership as well. So the, the membership gets involved that way. Most of the videos that we produced uh, and that were part of um, this process, you know, we were going to, you know, we did want to do those anyway, even if we, in the in the back, in the absence of, of COVID, because basically those get broadcast on our um, TV, local TV station. Um, so we have them broadcast to the membership there. We solicit all kinds of questions from tribal membership to both inform them what we're doing, but also ask them to, you know, say, hey, what, what do you care about? What, what, what's the most important to you? And, you know, I, I, while all of these acquisition strategies and these acquisition projects and things like that are really important, obviously, from an ecological standpoint, they're also really important, you know, to, to tribal membership. And one of the biggest things that we see 
uh, in terms of the need from tra tribal members is they feel like they're losing, especially with population growth. I mean, you can see, especially with COVID, um, these places are getting overrun. I mean, there's not many places that a tribal member can go anymore and feel isolated enough to practice cultural practices, whether that be winter bathing or hunting or just gathering or doing whatever. Um, the big the big things that we hear are that, you know, they need spaces where they can feel comfortable to practice their culture. And so these acquisition things we're talking about not only benefit ecological function and tribal treaty protected resources, but they also allow the ability for tribal members to have places that they can go and practice their culture. And that's kind of one of the big things, big, uh, big stories we hear over again is um, it, not only from restoration, but from when it comes to planning for recreation, when it comes to planning or development that these environments, there needs to be some places where tribes can practice their culture. And so that's, that's largely what we hear. Awesome, thank you for that answer. Um, we have a question on YouTube. It thanks you for your talk. And then uh, the person asks, the restoration goals are happening with lots of actors as you've talked about. Can you speak to some of the power dynamics among stakeholders in these projects? And um, what were those power dynamics key? Did they get in the way of, did they help with facilitating some of achieving the tribal goals? Yeah, there's definitely a lot of dynamics when it comes to, you know, when you talk about land management, there's no lack of interest and difference of opinions. Um, and yeah, there's always going to be some, some level of conflict, but the, especially in the Snohomish watershed and the Siligamish watershed, there's been a lot of effort to try to um, come up with ways where we have common ground. It's not always the case. We have all kinds of different groups um, that are involved as one called the sustainable land strategy, which uh, Talia provides a great, uh, a big portion of. There's also the Snohomish, um, there's different basin groups that kind of convene a whole variety of stakeholders together to look at technical and policy decision-making. Um, but yeah, there, there are differences of opinion, especially among, I mean, I think that the, the biggest and most notable, notable one typically is between fish interests, uh, environmental interests and um, agriculture is largely where a big chunk of that that head you know goes goes head to head. But luckily, we do have some things in common. Neither of us want development in the floodplains. Um, we both think that agriculture is a better use and that it can be done sustainably, and that we want local food sources. So we do have some places of, uh, and we both essentially want to farm food. I mean, the tribes want to farm native fish for for economic and cultural reasons, reasons, and farmers want to farm farm products for cultural reasons and economic reasons too. And so there's a lot of overlap there. When it comes to the brass tacks of specifics, things get complicated. And that's just a way that we we, we work out and figure out what works for who. Sometimes it's, it's collaborative and it works out really well. Sometimes there's winners and losers. Um, these wicked decisions are, are ones where there's no great you know, winner um, and, and there's, it's, it is a struggle. It's a continued conversation. I like to think that tribes have the longest perspective, um, that they've been here the longest and they probably have, they'll probably be, you know, that's what tribe, that's what the people always say is we've been here for the longest, we're not leaving. This is, you know, they can't just up and move. They have tribal, tri you know, this is their, their place, you know, um, and this, these watersheds are, are, there, are, are their sacred ground. And so they're not, they're not leaving. Um, and so I think even in relation to any other person on the landscape, they have the long game in mind. And I think we're starting to implement that long game and knowing that um, different generations of people come and go with their different ideals, but um, tribe's perspective has been pretty consistent, so. Awesome, thank you. Um, and just one quick last question before we go to the class portion. Um, another person thanks you for your presentation and then says, how did riparian plant restoration play into restoration planning and how were vocal species identified? I know that's not a very quick question, but. <laughs> no, that's totally fine. Yeah, so uh, obviously, you know, so, you know, I kind of focused on this connectivity piece that, that especially when, it, uh, and, and that really comes into play what I think um, is, is discussed there, comes into play, especially when we're talking about some of the floodplain flood plain connectivity. You know, we do these acquisitions and we, and we do the connectivity uh, removing the infrastructure. 
but we also look very important, very much at the planting aspect of things. Um, it depends on the project, what we want to do. We're kind of focusing a little bit more on this idea of planting densely without a lot of diversity at first, with the idea that the biggest challenge that we're having is invasive species coming in. And when we plant a lot of diversity, a lot of times it just gets overrun. The idea is to kind of get be dominance first and then come in and uh, thin out and do, and then add your diversity once we've kind of managed the invasive species. That's one strategy we're taking because we're talking about these big scales again, right? So if we're talking to like a landscape type, trying to get uh, diversity right from the beginning, we end up having prohibitive costs and especially when it comes to maintenance. So we're kind of focusing on that, but we're also looking at places where it doesn't make sense to plant and we can let native species come in on their own, especially when it comes to estuary areas. We plant the riparian areas, but when it comes to especially salt marsh areas, we've seen pretty good success with just allowing natural recruitment as long as we manage invasive species like pepperweed and phragmites and other species that might be deleterious to establishing those native species. So sometimes we focus on natural recruitment. A lot of times we focus on how can we get the best restoration done in the long term with the goal of establishing floodplain forests, uh, getting things on a trajectory to floodplain forest establishment. Awesome. Thank you very much for that answer. Um, thank you again for your talk. We're going to go to the one on one portion of the class and end the YouTube stream. I want to take a quick opportunity to say thank you to everybody who's watching. Thank you for the great questions. And also to remind you that we do not have seminar next week, but we will the following week. So thanks everybody for watching. We'll see you then.